men for sure. Welcome. Glad you're here today on this Mother's Day. Glad you've chosen to be in worship with us in presence as well as online. I have a question. Why are shooting stars so fast? Because they're traveling light. Because they're traveling, <laughs> traveling light. Well, good morning. <laughs> Wonderful to see all of you in this Easter season. Let's join together in our call to worship, a responsive reading. Please join with me in your part. This is the good news which we proclaim to you. Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Walk in the light of his love. We live in the light of his teachings and healing mercies. Come, let us worship the one who overcame death. Let us celebrate the triumph of our Lord. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.
Amen. I invite you to be seated. Let's join together in prayer. Gracious God, you are forever faithful, and you've drawn us to worship today because we were designed to worship you. We have a deep longing within our souls to be connected to you and to be in fellowship with one another. So bless this time that we've set aside to hear your word, to sing our songs, to hear our story, and to be written into that story in our own lives. That deep longing that has brought us here, even if we can't name it, is very real. And we're grateful, Holy Spirit, that you draw us into this place. And each of us come with different needs. Today, perhaps we need comfort. Some of us need encouragement. Some of us need challenge. But you know what we need. Each of us individually are known intimately by you. You know us better than we know ourselves. So bless us in this time with your grace, your power, your action in our lives. Help us to open ourselves to be present to you in the midst of all the distractions, to focus on you, the one who is worthy of worship. All of this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand for our morning hymn. seated. Well, James, Amanda, Madeline, and Clark, come on up here, please. Welcome to Amanda's parents from Kansas City, Overland Park, to be specific. We're glad that you've joined us today. And guess what, Madeline? I need your help. Are you going to be my helper? Okay, thank you. I appreciate your willingness to help me. There's that. This is and this candle is going to burn to remind us of this sacred moment that God has given us as a gift of his grace and love. So we'll leave it up there, but I need you to hold that, please, Madeline. James, come on over here, please. You're such a good helper. Thank you. Every time we have the privilege and honor of celebrating this sacrament, we are reminded of what a sacrament is. A sacrament is a visible sign of God's invisible grace. So the chief actor in the drama of baptism is the Trinity. But James and Amanda, today you make your profession of faith on behalf of Clark until that day when he can make his own. Just like you experienced, you experienced that same thing, Madeline when you were a lot younger. She said, okay. 
So congregation, I invite you to participate by looking on the screen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, it is through the sacrament of holy baptism that we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and we are given new birth. New birth through what? Water and the Holy Spirit. And all this is God's gift offered to us without price. So in our tradition, we speak of this phrase called prevenient grace. It's the grace that comes before we even know what's happening. And that's what we celebrate in this sacrament. Now, does Clark know all that's happening? Probably more than we think he knows, but he can't articulate it now, but God is at work. So, Amanda and James, I ask you these questions that are not our questions. They belong to the universal church. 2,000 years old, think about that. On behalf of the whole church, I ask you both, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness? Do you reject the evil powers of this world? And do you repent of your sin? If so, please say, we do. We do. And do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil? injustice and oppression in whatever forms they may present themselves? If so, please say, we do. We do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in His grace and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. If so, please say, we do. And will you nurture Clark James in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself to profess his faith openly and to lead a Christian life? If so, please say, we will. We will. Congregation, do you as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, enthusiastically say, we do. We're getting better each week, I think. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include Clark James now before you in your care? If so, would you respond with me, please? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Clark with a community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in his trust of God and be found faithful in his service to others. Amen. Now, some of you have heard me say this before, but I have to say it every single time. Today, Clark James is not being baptized into this congregation or into the United Methodist Church. He's being baptized into the body of Christ. And the way that we mark that and name that and claim that is by participating in the profession of faith as contained in the Apostles' Creed. So if you're physically able, would you stand, please? Do you believe in God the Father? Together we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So, Amanda and James... When this precious one came into the world as a gift to you, you gave him the full name of, and guess what, Madeline? We need your help in this too. So we're going to say his full name together. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Clark, Clark James, James Tomlin. Is, now, James, he's named after you, right? Yeah. Is he named after anybody else? My grandfather. Wonderful. And look at this beautiful ring. Is this from your parents? How beautiful. Look at this. This gift. Look at this gift. You are a gift, Clark James. 
So we give thanks, O oh God, for the gift of this water. And whether it's a drop or an ocean, this water points to your power. Invisibly at work in this moment, claiming Clark as your own forever. By the power of your spirit, make this water holy to accomplish your purposes in Clark's life in this day and in all the days to come throughout the whole of his life. For we pray this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, now, Madeline, are you getting ready here? I'm going to need your help here. Clark James, child of the living God, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, Madeline, do you want to help your brother? Yeah. You're such a good helper. Thank you. Now, in your hand is this oil. Thank you, Madeline. Please. In keeping with Christian tradition, when the newly baptized, no matter their age, came out of the waters of baptism, they were anointed with oil as a sign of God's blessing and as a symbol of the seal of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit would keep Clark in God's love and grace the whole of his life. Now think about that. That's a powerful thing. Thank you, sir. And this oil is yours to keep as a sign of God's blessing on this day. So, Clark James, I mark you with the sign of the cross so that you might know that you belong to Jesus. And I pray his blessing on your hands that you will serve him upon your feet, that you will follow him upon your heart, that you will always know how deeply he loves you and upon your lips that you'll always speak of love for him and upon the whole of your life that you will always know that Jesus loves you and will be with you every moment of every day now and forever amen Madeline what do you think about this your brother has just been baptized the choir now is going to sing for us a special song so we want to turn and face them as they sing their blessing Congregation, would you offer your congratulations and blessings through your applause, please? This is wonderful. So, Madeline, can we just stand up here and just do this for a while? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. God bless. A reading from the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. A 
A reading from the Gospel of John. At that time, the festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple, in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me. But you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. They give me eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The word of the God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
Thank you, Hillsingers. That is one of my most favorite anthems. And the guy who created that the arrangement is a friend of Dr. Reine's, who is, where did Dr., there you are, Dr. Moore. Dr. Reine and Dan Forrest, very good friends. You know that too, Dr. Knight. Well, last Sunday I started a sermon series, but I didn't intend for it to be a sermon series, but it has become a sermon series. So I started last week, I'm going to do a little more today, and then I will finish on the 29th. So I'm preaching in commas rather than periods. And next Sunday, Dr. J, you're going to be preaching. And he has a really good and important word on doubting Thomas. I know it's going to be a good and important word because so many people struggle with doubt. But you bring a fresh interpretation to that passage, so I hope you're here for that. Well, we need to pray, and then I'll jump in. Lord God, thank you for the gift and beauty of this day that you have made. Help us to rejoice and to be glad in it. We thank you and praise you for your word and pray that it will come alive for us, that your spirit and our souls would intersect and we would find new meaning and new life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the five movements of a resurrected life. Last week I did the first two, so you can go online if you weren't here to hear those. But I want to pick up a little bit just because movement three won't make much sense, perhaps. So how many of you have heard of Jim Cimbala, who's the pastor of the Brooklyn Tabernacle in Brooklyn? He's written many books. He's probably the most famous non-seminary trained pastor in the world. And he simply followed this calling. And when people go there, they experience heaven on earth. It's an amazing thing. So Easter Sunday, a few years back, Pastor Simbala was ending the day with his eighth service and he was exhausted and he was the last one out of the sanctuary and there was a man sitting right over there he was obviously a hard living person Pastor Simbala walked toward him and thought Here's a homeless man. They typically have homeless people come into their sanctuary. And he was thinking, I just finished my eighth service. I'm exhausted. I don't have energy for another soul. So he walks up to this man and says, Sir, may I help you? And he said, My name's David. I'm 32. Pastor Simbola said he looked like he was 80. He's thinking, I'm tired. I want to leave. I want to get this man off my hands. He pulls out his wallet, takes out a $20 bill and says, would you please go get some lunch on me? And the man turned the money away and said, I don't want your money. I want the Jesus that you just preached about. If you don't give me that Jesus you just preached about, I'm going to die, and I know it. I'm not going to survive on the streets if you don't give me that Jesus. That's what I was trying to say last Sunday. (laughs) That you have this character named Peter. He's feeling dejected, all the D's of life. He's dejected, he's depressed, he's discouraged, he's down and out, he's ready to throw in the towel. In fact, he has given up his life to follow a Jesus, a Messiah who ends up dead on a cross and he's partially to blame and he knows it. And so he walks the 65 miles back home gets in the boat that belonged to the family business, the fishing business, 
And he spends all night fishing and he catches what? Those of you who are here, he catches nothing. He goes from failure to failure, from discouragement to deeper discouragement. That's where Peter was. And there are people today listening to my voice who know that feeling. And if not in the present moment, there have been moments in your life where you can relate to Peter and say, wow, I know what that's like. But Jesus pursues him. Now today we're celebrating Good Shepherd Sunday. You'll see an image up here of Jesus a Good Shepherd. This was an image that was in the front of the church where I worshiped as a child and youth before going to college. And every Sunday I would just sit and gaze at this painting. It was right above the altar and being a small eastern Montana church, we didn't get the cream of the crop for pastors. They were sincere, but they couldn't preach their way out of a wet sack. <laughs> and they were nice, and they were well-meaning, but all I could do was just look at Jesus, the good shepherd. We had one pastor that read every word that he spoke, and there were four pages. And when the sermon was really boring, I'd say, there's one there's two <laughs> I'm sorry Lord <laughs> but I'm being honest but I would gaze at the good shepherd I just spend the whole hour just looking at Jesus a good shepherd and that's what Peter was doing is that once he had that encounter with the risen Christ. He just gazed at him as Jesus gazed at him. So, today is Good Shepherd Sunday as I shared and this is my favorite icon of Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Because Jesus is holding the sheep. And I want you to notice his hands. You see the nail prints. Jesus in resurrected glory is holding on to the lamb and I want you to notice the way he's holding on to the lamb. How is he holding on to the lamb? With intensity. <laughs> you are not going to take this sheep from me. And that's what Diana and April just read for us. That the good shepherd holds us and he doesn't just hold us I mean he holds us and nobody uh, nobody I mean nobody is going to steal you or me away from the good shepherd so when you look at that image I hope you see the clenched fists you're mine and you're mine forever and that's what Jesus was doing for Peter he showed up in the most despairing of circumstances and said I have claimed you you're mine Well, third movement. They encounter the risen Christ. They go ashore. And what do they see? A charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. And you say, okay, that's an interesting tidbit. Why is John wanting us to see that first and foremost? They'd gone ashore and they saw a charcoal fire. When Peter denied Jesus, when Peter said, I don't know that man, three times, he did so before a charcoal fire. As Peter was coming to shore and he saw that charcoal fire, what do you think happened within him? Shame. Guilt. All of a sudden he feels worse than he did when he was walking those 65 miles away from Jerusalem to go back to the family business. Why does John want us to see that Jesus created a charcoal fire in the presence of this dejected man who's trying to get his life back together again. What's the point? 
Have you ever experienced shame? Now, let me be clear. In the presence of our medical professionals, there's good shame, there's toxic shame, there's good guilt and toxic guilt. Good shame, good guilt simply means you have a conscience. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about toxic shame. And have you ever had a shame spiral where there is a trigger that triggers your shame? And this is pretty busy, but I couldn't find one that's more simple, but I kind of like the color. (laughs) So you get this event trigger, and then the shame kicks in, and there's embarrassment, and there's guilt, and there's feeling of inadequacy, and you feel like you can't do anything right, and that you're a failure, and thoughts that everyone is judging you, upset with you, or dislikes you, gathering evidence that all of your thoughts are true, the urge to quit, isolate, withdraw, or run away, which leads to anxiety, depression, and hopelessness. All of that is happening in Peter. Now, if you're going to be honest in the house of the Lord... Every single one of us knows that spiral where there are triggers. It's like, root, 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 and all of a sudden, I'm the scum of the earth. Now, is there anybody in here that knows what I'm talking about today? That's where Peter is. So there's the shame trigger, there's the fire. But what does Jesus say to him? Well, come and have breakfast. Now they they knew that it was Jesus, and what does Jesus do in verse 13 there? Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now what's going on here? See, this is why I love the sacred word because on the surface it's like, Wow, I don't really need to know that they're doing... Oh, yes, we do need to know all these details because guess what? This is how we enter the story. This is our story. It's not just Peter's. We have the shame triggers that make us feel like we're worthless. And then Jesus, the good shepherd, comes along and says, why don't you come and have some breakfast with me? What? Do you think Peter lost his appetite when he saw that charcoal fire? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Whenever you have those moments of shame, and I won't get into the biology of this or the, the physiology of this or any other ology of this, but when we are anxious, we lose our appetite. Now, there's overeating to handle stress, but in these moments, it's like the last thing on my mind is eating because my mind is dealing with the three times that I denied the person who's just showing up. So Jesus takes some bread and gives it to them and does the same with the fish, and we say, okay, that's nice. What's the point? The answer's here. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. That means that I can regain my appetite in the, in the midst of the enemy of shame. Because Jesus is doing for Peter in that moment what only Jesus can do. And he's saying, You are my friend, and you are my friend forever. And in biblical days, and it's true even in our day, you never eat with an enemy, do you? Do you ever go out to lunch with an enemy? Well, of course not. You don't feel like eating when you're in the presence of your enemy. But in the first century, when you invited somebody to eat, it was the most sacred experience of friendship. It was Jesus saying to Peter, you're my friend and you're my friend forever and I'm bringing you in because I'm serving you and I am healing you and I'm restoring you and I'm declaring that you are mine forever. So in a moment, we're gonna gather at this sacred table. Sometimes people say, oh, Jeff, that communion thing, why do we have to do that again and again and again and again and again? Because do you realize what's happening at this sacred meal? Jesus is saying, come and eat. 
Come and eat. I want you to come and eat because you're my friend. I'm your good shepherd. I'm infusing you with life and love and grace and peace and joy. I'm giving you what no one else can. Now, in the Methodist tradition, you see, John Wesley, our founder, was very intent that this meal, this sacred meal, is so full of God's grace and God's power that anybody and everybody, most especially atheists, should come. Most people don't know that about our history. So one Sunday, this happened on a summer Sunday several years ago, I made the declaration. If you are here this morning and you are a doubter, if you are a declared unbeliever, I challenge you, I dare you to come and receive communion today. I did that. After the 11 o'clock service, I was greeting people and I noticed that there was this woman, older woman, standing off to the side and she waited till everybody was gone and then she came up to me and she said, I just want you to know I'm in town this weekend visiting my good friend and I came to church out of courtesy but I, I've been an atheist for all of my life. She said, well, actually, most of my life. And she said, you invited us to communion. And I went forward and I took communion. And she said, with misty eyes and forming, She said, those misty eyes looking right at me, she said, I just want you to know, now I know what I'm missing. And she just walked off. I've never seen her again. That's what Jesus is doing for Peter, and that's what Jesus will do for you and me today. Lord God, thank you. For how your word, though ancient, is real and relevant and alive. Today we pray. We pray for those who are locked in a cycle of shame. We pray that your amazing grace would set them free. We pray today, O God, for those among us in need of your healing grace. In mind, body, or spirit. Jesus, you're the good and great physician of our souls. Minister to us in ways that would restore us and remind us and heal us and claim us again and again and again with that promise that no one can snatch us from you. Today we pray for our mothers who have given us life and love Help us to show them reverence and honor. We pray today for mothers who've lost a child through death, that their faith may give them hope and their family and friends will be supportive and consoling. We pray for women who do not have children of their own, but who, like mothers, have nurtured and cared for us. And we pray today for mothers who have not been able to be a source of strength, who have not responded to the needs of their children, we pray for them today. We pray for those who are unable to have children, who desperately long for motherhood, but find themselves in that deep, despairing place. We pray that you would be their good and tender shepherd. God, we thank you and we praise you that you see us right where we are and you receive us just as we are. We love you, we praise you, we worship you, we adore you. We magnify your holy name. Amen and amen. The ushers will now come and wait upon us.
I invite, invite those who are helping to serve communion to come forward at this time as we prepare. And as Jeff mentioned in the sermon, we do serve an open table. Everyone is welcome to this table because it's God's table, not ours. And you're welcome to come. You don't have to be a member, member of this church or any church to participate in the Lord's Supper. We take communion by method of intinction, meaning you'll come out the right side, beginning in the front rows, the right side of your section, come forward with open hands. You'll receive the wafer, dip that into the cup, and take that and then return to your, to your seats. If you're not yet comfortable with that method, we do have individualized communion cups. You can take those, and we'll just offer you a blessing as you take that and return to your seats. I invite you now to join me in the ancient prayer known as the Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing everywhere and always to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so we join our voices with all the company of heaven together as we say, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is Jesus who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We ask, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body and blood of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with each other, one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All glory, honor, and praise be yours, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And now together let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The table is now open.
Gracious God, we give thanks for this sacred meal that you have invited us to because you desire to be one with us in an intimate way, to be in fellowship with us, to hold us and never let us go. We give thanks for this meal. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go ahead, Heidi. This morning, as we are giving thanks for the homes and families that raised us up, we are celebrating with those that are journeying on our graduates. We have several graduates here with us today, and I will be reading all of the names. Lauren Tyler Brown, daughter of Tyler and Leslie Brown, is graduating from Andover High School. She will be attending Colorado School of Mines to major in biomedical engineering. Grady Reed Dick, son of Bart and Carmen Dick, is graduating from Sunrise Christian Academy. He's going to play basketball at the University of Kansas. Rock chalk. <laughs> Cannon J. Fuller, son of Laura Fuller and Brad Fuller, is graduating from Andover High School. He plans on attending Kansas State University. Samantha Riley McClellan, daughter of Roger and Christy McClellan and Lindsay McClellan, is graduating from Andover High School. In the fall, Sammy will attend Auburn University in Alabama to study Health Service Administration. Stratton Robert McClellan, son of Roger and Christy McClellan and Lindsay McClellan, is graduating from Andover High School. In the fall, Stratton will attend SMU in Dallas, Texas to study finance at the Cox School of Business. Nicole Elizabeth McIlvain, daughter of Jason and Julie McIlvain, is graduating from Andover Central High School. She plans to attend the University of Arkansas to major in animal science, minor in Spanish, and intends to go to vet school. Rebecca Ruth Miller, daughter of Casey and Sarah Miller, is graduating from Wichita Collegiate School. Becca plans to study music at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri. She will also be on the stunt team. Carly Nicole Parker, Parker, daughter of John and Lori Parker, is graduating from Andover Central High School. Carly plans to attend Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, to major in science of neuroscience and minor in Spanish. Sarah Grace Sinclair, daughter of Deidre Sinclair and Tim Sinclair, is graduating from Andover High School. Sarah's future plans include studying engineering at Kansas State University. We give thanks for our graduates with our applause. Join me in prayer. God of truth and knowledge, by your wisdom we are taught the way and the truth. Bless these graduates as they now finish this course of study. We thank you for those who taught and worked beside them and all who supported them along the way. Walk with these grads as they leave and move forward in life. Take away their anxiety and confusion of purpose. Strengthen their many talents and skills. Instill in them a confidence in the future you plan, where energies may be gathered up and used for the good of all people. For the sake of Jesus Christ, amen. Congratulations again. We're so proud of each of you. Let's give them another hand, shall we? <clears throat> well, congregation, if you're able, would you please stand? Thank you for your donations for the Dignity Drive. We've had lots of donations, and it's a wonderful thing. We're going to be helping lots and lots of people. So my sisters and brothers in Christ, may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord look upon our lives with his favor and may he grant us his peace in our lying down and in our rising up, in our labor and in our leisure, in our laughter and in our tears. In the whole of our lives, may we always know that Jesus, the good shepherd, is the hound of heaven who is seeking us and loving us and healing us and claiming us as his own forever. Go forth in his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Let's sing our closing song.